Yes, so uh, very happy to be here. And uh, well, I'm, as Hendrik said, from uh, KTH. Um, and in that environment, kind of a strange animal, maybe because I'm also, I have a background in ethnomusicology. So, um, despite the fact that I'm there at a technical university, I'm also, I have a background in humanities, and uh, so I do a lot of engineering stuff in the sound and music computing area, but also ethnography, mainly in Crete, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about here and today. Um, so I will start um, introducing a little bit about the performance context that we have in Crete, and I will talk to you about my research question that I have in that work that is related to my field work. So in Cretan uh, performance context, so in the island of Crete in Greece, um, there are several performance contexts. For example, one example is the so-called parea, which is the probably most participatory music performance uh, framework, so to say, in uh, social gatherings. So that's a key notion all over Greece. Um, and it is a very important uh, framework um, for um, acquisition and learning of the repertoire. So that is very informal, a very informal context. And um, in my study, I have a look at the so-called uh, glendi or panigiri, as uh, depending on the area where you, how you would call it, um, which is a more formal framework. So it's publicly announce, announced events, mostly happening during the summer uh, in village uh, squares or schoolyards. Uh, many people taking, pla uh, taking part in that. Um, small villages very often organizing events uh, for people, like 1,000 visitors, dancers uh, coming to these festivities. These festivities usually last from the late evening until the morning hours, uh, and you have an elevated stage, as you slightly can probably can see here, there's an elevated stage here in the PA system. And uh, there's in, th in this performance context, there's a participatory character mostly regarding the dance, uh, with differentiation in the degree depending on uh, period and, and area. But uh, there's always a large, it's a bit, um, well, be between the tables where all these people are seated and the stage, there's a usually very large uh, dance floor. And uh, my research questions um, with which I, well, it's a probably a life I say that I go into the field with research questions. I usually come out of the field with them and then go back and so on. But uh, the questions that I will talk about here is, um, so how do repertoire choices and rhythmic processes provide structure to an event on a large and on a short time scale, respectively? And how do dancers participate in shaping rhythmic processes and musical form? So how does something that looks like a more concert setting actually have a strongly participatory character through the pa participation of the dancers? Um, I will, as I said, uh, have a look specifically at the Glendi. I will have a uh, focus on a certain repertoire, which are uh, the sirtos and the leaping dances, two forms of dances that are very common in Crete. Um, and uh, I will focus on specific region regions um, and a selection of renowned musicians. Um, after some years of field work, um, I focused on some specific areas here now in this talk. So let's, uh, I will show some musical examples a little bit later. So because there's not so much time, I will just present in words shortly what is, uh, what I, what is the Cretan Sirtos, for example. So as most Cretan dances, um, also this dance is danced in an open circle counterclockwise. And uh, the dance has origins in Western Crete. And it has a quite specific uh, structure, an AB structure. So it is made up of uh, two melodies. One tune is made up of two melodies. And uh, these tunes are combined to longer series, where, for example, this would be 
the first tune, it would be repeated several times. Lyrics would be arranged to these two parts. And then uh, the musicians put the next tune, which is very often, with or which may be spontaneously, but there are also very common sequences of these tunes. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, leaping dances, which are a musical form based on melodic phrases of uh, two or four measures length. And uh, the players here in this form continuously elaborate the phrases and frequently introduce new phrases from the large repertoire of dance-related phrases. And compared to the sirtos, this form is more flexible because it does not have this fixed AB structure that is necessarily repeated to some extent, but it uh, provides a large degree of freedom to the musician to also react to the dancers. Um, there are several leaping dances in Crete. Um, here in my talk we will encounter two of them. The Pithiktos, I will not go into the uh, naming of these dances because then uh, the confusion will be complete. Uh, but I will just mention that there is uh, the Pithiktos, which is basically um, consisting of a lot of local variations and which is mainly from central and uh, eastern Crete, whereas the Pendosalis is another leaping dance uh, with roots in western Crete. The material that I have a look at is um, for coming from two areas, basically. Uh, I had a look at three events from one area rather in the east of Crete, um, so at, uh, slightly north of the uh, Lasithi Plateau, which is right here. And uh, one event in uh, Kisamos, which is uh, a very strong violin tradition, um, or which has a very strong viol violin tradition still nowadays, uh, in the very west of Crete. So in these events we recorded uh, with multiple uh, video cameras and uh, audio recordings at two positions, uh, which enabled me to do a quite uh, you know, elaborate analysis also posterior after the experience in the field. So the methods that I use then to, to, um, to have a look at my research questions is I annotate form and duration of tunes throughout these whole events. Um, well, and each of these events lasts uh, between, th the durations of the these events is between five and eight hours. Uh, I compute tempo, tempo curves and rhythm patterns. So that is the slightly computational approach here where I have a look at how the tempo proceeds and which kind of rhythmic patterns are maybe there in the recordings. And based on these observations, I also conduct interviews with the involved performers in what I call a collaborative performance analysis, where I uh, have a look at the performance recordings together with the performers and uh, have a analysis together with them regarding what is happening in the dance uh, while watching the video of the dancers in specific parts and performances that, for example, that uh, emerged as specific or particular in my previous analysis. And I also did some things that I will maybe not talk about today because of the time, but uh, I also, the video recordings also enabled me to look at the gaze directions between the musicians in order to get at least some indicator for where the focus of the attention of the musician lies upon in order to see how the communication within uh, the band works, so to speak, or uh, also towards the dancers, so how much of the attention might be directed towards the dancers. Okay, so um, what, what do I get here? So, as I said, we had, I, I chose four events, one of these being from the west of Crete, um, and I annotated um, the, um, the musical material that I, uh, or that was performed in these events. And um, one thing that is not astonishing after years of field work is that uh, the Sirtos, the first dance that we focus upon, uh, takes the majority, so that's in all of these figures here, the black part of the cake. Um, so that's uh, the largest extent of a festivity cons consists of a Sirtos in Crete. That's a phenomenon that is common all over Crete. 
Um, but um, so that's something that uh, I wouldn't have needed to count so much for that. So it's probably not necessary to quantify each and every qualitative insight. Uh, but uh, something that that uh, that I understood by counting actually is um, the importance of breaks. Um, so we can see that the break, which is uh, the second uh, most uh, frequent um, part of the repertoire, so to speak, in a Cretan event, um, is in particular very frequent in uh, the first event, and um, that. Uh, directed my attention to the fact that these breaks are actually very important uh, moments of interactions between musicians and audience where also economic interactions take place such as placing orders to which pieces should be played next and so on. And interestingly these kinds of uh, economical interactions are most intense uh, in the west of Crete. Uh, and here the breaks take the largest proportion. So there's a very important factor here, these interactions between musicians and dancers before playing a dance and ordering and arranging the next piece. Another thing that, um, that emerges out of these uh, number exercise is that um, the smallest um, proportion of the Pithichtos is in event one, which is the leaping dance from west and east. Whereas the Pendosalis, which is the leaping dance from the west, takes the largest proportion. So I came up then uh, having a look at these two events, com uh, comparing the sequences that go on there and taking the breaks kind of as um, the start and the ending point of a sequence that is going on. And um, comparing these two models here, uh, I can see that it is, the, let's say, the thickness of these arrows kind of is immediately related to the numbers of transitions that I, I saw in these events. And we can see that this upper right thing here is always the most frequent, um, it's the most frequent s sequence in the events. And we can see a difference that there's always a break, a sirtos, and then we go to a leaping dance that kind of um, increases the intensity of um, the dance, uh, the dance activity further compared to the sirtos. Um, but in the west of Crete, we have the local leaping dance being prominent, and uh, in the east of Crete, um, the eastern leaping dance. So that's um, a lot about the the overall structure of the event and how certain things about the audience and the location might affect the structure of such an event. But what is happening then regarding uh, rhythm and tempo? So I annotated um, tempo trajectories. So what we see here in this figure is basically uh, for two events in comparison. So again, event one is the one from the west and event two is one from the east. We see how in average um, the sirtos um, proceeds in tempo from the beginning of a sira, so from the beginning of these combinations of tunes, towards the end of the sira. And um, we can see that they are very similar despite uh, the repertoire being played. It is in both cases, sirtos, it is very similar melodies. Um, but they are in these two events, in the west and in the east, they are played with almost non-overlapping tempi despite being uh, apparently related to the same form of dance. Um, and in each event I, I observe that typically um, the, the tempo approaches a final tempo value in all of these performances that seem to be uh, the point of accumulation for the specific musicians that are there performing, which you can see that this thing here that denotes the variance in the, in the measures kind of gets smaller towards the end. So it kind of goes to an end point where the performers um, reach the highest point in tempo. Um, but there's something strange going on here, which is again something where I obtained a new insight by counting uh, that I d was not aware of um, doing 
um, field work. Uh, and that is that tempo increases steadily for event two and also for event three and four that I do not show here, but not for event one. So I wondered what is going on there and had a closer look. So here we have phenomena such as this. So this is a particular performance then from event one. So we have things like uh, these dotted lines here denote the tune boundaries. So this is one tune of A, B, A, B <coughs> combinations. Then the musicians go to a transition to the next tune and so on. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tunes here. The black thing denotes the, the tempo curve. And um, we can see that there is a, a strong relation between the musical structure of the Sirtos changes and how the tempo develops. Um, but what is interesting is that the tempo interacts more importantly actually here in this case with dance activity, which I will show in two videos now. So um, my hypothesis that is here that uh, the more formal organization that we have actually in the west of Crete still, which is not so much present in the festivities in the east, actually facilitates, facilitates a more, in, more immediate interaction between the musicians and the dancers. And this is what emerges as these kind of unusual tempo proceedings. So let's have a look at how the, uh, the first tempo increase here, this very steep tempo increase emerges. <laughs> Watch the first dancer. He clearly indicates to the musicians to lift it up. And we are here now in the first tune. So the musicians react by a tune change and lift up the tempo, which enables the dancer to improvise. And he still wants more. He again gestures, and now we are here. fantastic uh, to watch that video in half speed and to observe how the melody and the steps of the dancers go together. It is uh, beautiful. Um, but at the end I said uh, that we have this uh, tempo decrease. So what is happening there? We know somewhere here. There's an inexperienced dancer here. And uh, he called for another more experienced dancer to help him a little bit, learning the steps actually. And the musicians observe that point again and decrease the tempo in order to facilitate this kind of online dancing lesson that is going on there in this festivity right now. So this is a kind of uh, parti participatory creation of the musical form that is going on and that is very strong as far as I can observe, especially in events where this immediate interaction is facilitated through a relatively small number of dances here. Um, now I will show you a slightly confusing figure maybe. Um, I won't explain it. Um, 
actually a little bit, okay, but this looks like a spectrogram, but it actually isn't. So this is a perspective on, uh, on rhythmic patterns. So time is here on this axis, and I only want to say that on this axis there is something related to tempo, and black lines kind of show us if a certain periodicity, a certain repetition at that specific tempo is very intense or not. So what we can see in this figure, for example, is that um, the leaping dance is in event one, so the lut pattern that is very strong in its intensity is actually the playing of the lut in in this in the west, at least in this uh, in this um, in this group of musicians is actually quite differently shaped than this one, which is a more equally weighted uh, strumming, so just an an up and down strumming without any patterning actually. But what I uh, want to direct your attention to is, uh, for example, here we have a relatively equally spaced uh, or equally spaced pattern of black lines, but here in the end suddenly we have something that shows an, an, an increase of uh, density to the double. So here basically the musicians, uh, or mainly the lute, which is grasped by this representation, increases uh, the intensity of strokes a lot. So this um, directed my attention to the following sequence. So this is exactly that part, and I will again show you the video uh, so you can see what is happening there. So what was happening here, and that is actually, uh, that was an outcome of my uh, collaborative performance analysis, so my conversations with a musician. So the Lira player actually playing in that uh, performance, Aradis Pedidakis, he told me that what they are doing there in this moment, this increase of density that I notated here, uh, the lute strokes and the Lira notes, um, is actually uh, performed in order to enable the dancer whom they observe uh, dancing alone in the middle of the circle to start spinning. So actually they observe the dancer and increase this, uh, their rhythmic patterning in order to enable the dancer to facilitate this kind of dance movement. So, um, just these were some examples, so let me just discuss a little bit what, what is happening here in the, in, in the research that I'm trying to do. So I'm combining a variety of methods, um, which is participant observation, interviews with dancers, musicians, yes, artistic practice, so I play lute and uh, dance myself. Um, this posterior video analysis, the annotation of events, and computational audio analysis, so that's a bunch of different things, and uh, I try to think about how they these things work together, and um, in my experience, so that's basically what, I, what I'm doing here, I'm going through a circle um, that relates uh, empirical phases with theoretical phases, so ethnography, uh, re reshaping methods, and then an empirical phase that is a corpus analysis, or rather a computational thing, and then back uh, to, to reshaping and comparing key concepts, and then again back to the field and start from the beginning, refine, re-ask questions. So this approach is motivated by uh, ideas of uh, semiology of music, as uh, discussed by Molino and Natiez, and um, I think that a combination of perspectives, um, such as through ethnography, artistic practice, and uh, computational analysis, facilitate a triangulation between ethnography, corpus study, and uh, historical background. Um, I will take two or three more minutes uh, just to give my personal point of view on computation. So computation is rather the method of counting, so it's not about computers necessarily. So the uh, computation may be the act of mathematical calculation, which is, uh, in the simplest case, uh, the method of counting one, two, three, four, and so on, and writing a number. Not necessarily the use of computers. 
Um, so in this wider sense of fundamental question, maybe if counting and data represent representations derived from it may enable to discover how fine details in performance bear social meaning. As a uh, quote by Perlman, uh, the more detailed our te technical analysis, the more opportunities we will have to show how sounds and context are subtly intertwined. Um, I think that general corpus studies should be considered in combination with data particularities. If we just go for some general data distributions, we don't get to the specific moments that are kind of peculiar, and these are, in my experience, the ones that are interesting when um, trying to reshape my research questions to go back to the field. And uh, in the end, I mean, statistics can, the all statistics can arrive at is at correlation, while uh, I would claim that in research in ethnography, um, I can get a stronger picture towards causality by speaking with musicians and yeah, performing myself. Thank you. <laughs>